Our first speaker for the day is Robert Mayhew. Uh, Robert is professor of philosophy at Seton Hall University. He's a member of the Ayn Rand Institute Board of Directors, and he's uh, deeply knowledgeable about ancient philosophy and about Ayn Rand's philosophy. And he's gonna be speaking to us about Ayn Rand and enlightenment attitudes towards religion. Good afternoon, uh, morning and evening, I guess. Uh, it's a wonderful product of the enlightenment that we can be talking to people in all over, all over the world. Um, now, last night's keynote lecture by Ankar Gatte is, I believe, a perfect background or setup uh, to my own talk today. But if you weren't able to listen to his, that shouldn't be a, a problem. I, I regard this as a self-contained uh, lecture. Uh, as Ankar mentioned, Ayn Rand saw the Enlightenment as the continuation of the Renaissance. I agree, and so it's useful uh, to begin by saying a few words about this period. Incidentally, I take the Renaissance to refer roughly to the 15th and 16th centuries, the Enlightenment roughly to the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, but precise dates don't really matter that much. Renaissance, of course, means rebirth, and though, although it's often been taken to mean the rebirth of classical learning, which it certainly was, or uh, of the related rebirth, classical, rebirth of the classical concern for the well-being of humans here on earth, hence expressions like Renaissance uh, humanism, these are derivatives of the more essential rebirth, the rebirth of reason after its zombie-like existence in the dark and middle ages. Now I see the uh, rebirth of reason in the Renaissance uh, having taken three forms. The first of these is the most important, the most essential, most genuine, for without it, this rebirth would have been stillborn. I'm referring to the elevation and assertion of reason as an autonomous and crucially important faculty, the power of which should not be undercut or overruled by faith dogma, superstition. This should be most of all what we think of as the core of the Renaissance spirit. Reason as the means of discovering truth, expanding our knowledge, improving human life, and shining light onto darkness, onto error. For example, in philosophy, the Renaissance Aristotelian Pietro Pomponazzi wrote in 1515 a treatise called On the Immortality of the Soul which argued on Aristotelian grounds that the soul died with the body. Or in the sciences, even better example, uh, Galileo, who really straddles the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. His wonderful little treatise, Starry Messenger from 1610, to name just one work, uh, demonstrated among other things through careful reasoning based on empirical data that there are moons of Jupiter and in doing so, he debunked the idea, a dogma inherited from the Middle Ages, that every celestial object orbited the center of the solar system. But as I said, there were also two deformed forms of the rebirth of reason. One was to hold that, yes, reason is a major value, a wonderful tool, and with it, we can give Christianity the support it needs. For example, the 15th century Renaissance Platonist Marsilio Ficino used reason as he conceived of it, Platonic wisdom, to defend what he considered true Christianity. Reason was more than just the handmaiden of faith on his view, and faith could not trump or contradict reason. But serving faith was one of its most significant values. Finally, there is Renaissance skepticism. Fueled by the rediscovery of ancient Greek skepticism, especially the works of Sextus Empiricus, which were pretty quickly translated into Latin, here we find reason liberated from the shackles of the dark and Middle Ages, turning in on itself, purportedly to expose its own serious limitations. For instance, Michel de Montaigne, 16th century, regarded skepticism as the rational alternative to religious dogma. We must, he believed, be humble about our reason and confess that knowledge and truth are unattainable. 
and therefore so are moral absolutes. In the realm of morality, there is only custom. He's a cultural relativist and you can see that in his essay uh, on cannibals. I regard Shakespeare as another Renaissance skeptic. His quintessential work of skepticism as I interpret it is Hamlet from around 1600. Pomponazzi's arguments against the immortality of the soul are not liberating for they cannot establish with certainty that there is no afterlife. All they prove is that there are powerful arguments against it. Anything close to a fully certain case would require the seemingly impossible, dying, coming back and reporting what one saw. But the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will, that's Hamlet of course. It freezes our ability to deliberate and act Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. Reason, this marvelous faculty, cannot answer the big questions in life and guide us in our actions. And it cannot rule out the lingering irrationalities of the past. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. That is, ghosts, they might exist. Though even returning from the dead, does not seem to establish certainty for Hamlet. Unfortunately, it was Renaissance skepticism that came across as anti-religion, whereas the people who were much better tended to concede a certain legitimacy to religion. Many, if not most, of the excellent Renaissance thinkers, for instance, Pico della Merendola, remained Christian. The paradigmatic Renaissance man, Leonardo da Vinci, whose religiosity is a matter of some controversy. Uh, he's been described as an absent-minded Catholic. He asked for a priest uh, to hear his confession at the end of his life. And Pomponazzi, whose philosophy you'd think would rule out traditional religion, I mean, no afterlife, right? He added what was at the time a typical proviso from philosophers like him, namely that the view that the soul died with the body was a philosophical truth, which could not overturn theological truth. Whether this was a genuine belief of his or stated insincerely merely to retain his position or patrons doesn't really matter from the point of view of history as this sort of concession to religion will continue to play, uh, continue to be a big problem. I mention all of this because each of these three trends, a robust respect for reason, reason viewed as a powerful tool for supporting religion, and skepticism as the proper application of reason, these continue uh, into the Enlightenment, often becoming compromised and intermingled. In what follows, I'll be focusing in large part on the omissions or flaws in some, even some of the best Enlightened, enlightenment figures. So justice demands that I say at the outset that my appraisal of the enlightenment is generally speaking and this lecture notwithstanding, extremely positive. Reality has identity, follows causal laws and is fully intelligible. Reason is efficacious and autonomous and the source of human progress. Human beings are individuals possessing the right by nature to pursue happiness. All of this amounts to the essential enlightenment outlook. But to discuss Ayn Rand's relationship to the enlightenment on the topic of religion, I need to cover enlightenment era thinkers who did not live up to the enlightenment and even or especially the omissions or flaws of those who did live up to it. Now, I'm going to look briefly at five Enlightenment era thinkers, Descartes, Locke, Hume, Kant, and Jefferson, the first four are philosophers, in chronological order. Now the survey clearly is meant to be illustrative, not um, exhaustive. The most famous example of an early Enlightenment figure who purportedly regarded uh, reason as a powerful tool for supporting religion is Rene Descartes, who's not much later than Galileo. He died in, in 1650. Yesterday, uh, Ankar Gatte stressed uh, 
his, his um, Descartes, not Ankars, uh, his primacy of consciousness approach, I'll be focusing on the hidden religiosity of his philosophical program, which amounts to the same thing. Descartes stressed the importance of reason and method to attain certainty and of not being anchored to the past in creating his radical new philosophy. He wanted to wipe the slate clean and start from scratch based on reason alone, or so he claims. And yet it was the faith-based ideas of the past that set his agenda or that set the aims of the rigorous application of his rigorous application of reason. And in doing so, he ends up smuggling into 17th century culture, old Augustinian wine in shiny new enlightenment bottles. In his dedica dedicatory letter to the faculty of theology at the Sorbonne, in his meditations, Descartes writes, quote, I have always thought that two topics, namely God and soul, are prime examples of subjects where demonstrative proofs ought to be given with the aid of philosophy rather than theology, unquote. In addition to presenting a couple of pretty lame arguments for the existence of God, he also argues at length for the possibility of the soul surviving the death of the body. In doing so, he is obeying a request of Pope Leo X, who condemned philosophers like Pomponazzi, who claimed that such a view could not, that you know, the soul is not immortal, uh, the, sorry, the immortality of the soul could not be defended by reason. And Leo X urged Christian philosophers to demonstrate philosophically the immortality of the soul. And Descartes answered the, that call. Now, does Descartes dispense with faith? Not at all. Quote, it is of course quite true that we must believe in the existence of God because it is a doctrine of Holy Scripture. And conversely, that we must believe Holy Scripture because it comes from God. For since faith is the gift of God, he who gives us grace to believe other things can also give us grace to believe that he exists. But this argument cannot be put to unbelievers because they would judge it to be circular, unquote. Yes, we would. So he wants to save religion by providing it with a secure, rational foundation, the demonstration of the existence of God and the immortality of the soul, which I suspect he thought is the only thing that can save religion in this age of reason. The rest of his religious beliefs, for instance, in the Trinity, in the transubstantiation of the Eucharist, one can safely accept on faith. Faith isn't irrational on his view. If its foundational beliefs, God and immortal soul are secure. Further, his conception of metaphysics leaves open the possibility of miracles, making faith in them reasonable as well. One last point, uh, although Descartes hints at the importance of moral philosophy and that the new rational philosophy he's creating will culminate in quote, the highest and most perfect moral system, unquote. He never got around to it. And there's no reason to think that if he had, his ethics would have contradicted standard Christian ethics in any significant way. Descartes' approach to using reason to save religion had an influence in some, in some circles, and it continues to do so. There are people who think that if you, you know, can come up with intelligent uh, uh, design arguments or what have you, you that undergirds uh, a religion somehow. But it wasn't ultimately the most significant approach to rationally supporting religion. Because demonstrations of the existence of God and immortality are full of holes. It became much more common to follow the approach of someone like Pascal, another um, 17th century uh, French thinker, who began by limiting the scope of reason. The finite, Pascal says, can never know the infinite, uh, God and heaven, right? So, and then uh, trying to use reason to doubt, validate faith. So the approach is limit reason and then show that we can validate uh, faith um, 
uh, you know, given the limitations of reason. And if you know Pascal's wager, that's what he's doing. And this is why skepticism, which stresses the supposed limitations of reason, was so often unwittingly an ally of religion. But before get, uh, getting to Enlightenment era skepticism, I want to look at one of the most admirable figures in the Enlightenment, one who had a pro-reason outlook, a robust non-skeptical conception of reason, which is used with more or less vigor and success to deflate religion, but not however to demolish it. And I'm speaking of John Locke. I cannot get into the details of his philosophy, but he had a genuine respect for reason, its power and its value, though as Ankar mentioned yesterday, he lacked a proper understanding and defense of sense perception and the faculty of reason and how it operated. Locke admired rationality and its manifestations in life, industry, productivity, happiness. And all of this is intimately connected to what is most excellent in Locke, his political philosophy. Not only did Locke have a proper respect for reason, he also exhibited a real contempt for religious faith in its most irrational form. He called this enthusiasm, according to which passion for religion overpowers reason and causes people to accept irrational beliefs and to act irrationally. Locke associated enthusiasm, what other Enlightenment figures called fanaticism, with superstition, folly, and all the religious oppression of the Dark and Middle Ages and the remnant of these in his own time. Both the respect for reason and the denunciation of religious enthusiasm deserve our deepest respect. But Locke did not reject faith outright. In fact, he defended a conception of it. Faith is the acceptance of a belief based on revelation, he says, which cannot be discovered by reason. But what reason can do is demonstrate that some work held to be the revealed word of God is probably so, or it is reasonable to think so. Reason for Locke is more powerful than faith, and what is properly held by faith cannot contradict reason. Faith, he believes, is legitimate when it concerns questions reason cannot answer and where it can be shown through evidence that it is reasonable to accept some source as, in all probability, revealed truth. In his essay concerning human understanding, Locke writes that, quote, revelation in matters where reason cannot judge or but probably ought to be hearkened to, unquote, that is listened to. For instance, that the dead shall rise, quote, that the dead shall rise and live again. These and the like being beyond the discovery of reason are purely matters of faith with which reason has nothing to do. Reason is bound to give up its assent to such testimony, which it is satisfied comes from one who cannot err and will not deceive, that is God or a prophet. But yet it still belongs to reason to judge of the truth of its being a revelation, unquote. Both reason and faith on Locke's view have a role to play in ethics. The moral law can in part be demonstrated scientifically and objectively based on reason and a respect for nature. And in part, it is a matter of reasonable, as, you know, so-called reasonable faith, revealed truth concerning, for example, the moral precepts of Jesus. The best part, sorry, the best of the rational part of Locke's ethics, so to speak, is his superb theory of natural rights. You know, a, a right is a moral principle, as Ayn Rand puts it. Um, this theory is, is a part of ethics, or rather, I think it stands, a theory of right stands at the border between ethics and politics in a philosophical system. And Locke's conception of individual rights to life, health, liberty, property is implicitly egoistic. But a theory of rights is not all there is to ethics. 
and Locke was aware of this. And I think it's a confusion or lack of understanding or even helplessness concerning the fundamentals of ethics that played a major role in Locke's concession to religion. One needs more than just a theory of rights and the moral advice of Jesus seems to fulfill this need. He claims. Locke's work, The Reasonableness of Christianity as Delivered in the Scriptures from 1695, purports to be a rational, non-enthusiastic defense uh, of in, in the sense of enthusiasm as irrational, right? Non-enthusiastic defense of the basic beliefs of Christianity. I find it a disappointing work. It's surprisingly devoid of fundamental arguments as opposed to arguments concerning the interpretation of scripture. It asserts more than defends prophecy and miracles as reasonable. I had assumed in reading it that Locke's intended audience must be Christians of various sorts whom he wanted to all get along and tolerate each other by setting out the bare minimum that all Christians ought to, re uh, to reasonably believe. And the work in fact was criticized for being not Christian enough, for being anti-Trinitarian or even deist or deistic. But in fact, Locke, Locke claimed in response to his critics that the work was, was written, quote, chiefly for those who were not yet thoroughly or fully Christian, unquote. And that to me is baffling. I mean, if he, he actually thought that this work somehow gave rational support for a view of ethics. What I think is clear is that Locke regards the reasonable acceptance of Christian, Christian morality as crucially important, that people accept that with the fall of Adam, humans became sinners and moral, sorry, sinners and mortal in need of moral improvement and so of ethics, and that Jesus came and made redemption possible so that there's a point to being moral. How is redemption possible? Through obeying Christian ethics as Locke understands it, which guarantees that the unjust will not have eternal life. Morality would not make sense, he seems to be saying, if the bad people should end up in paradise or if the good should not. There are, Locke says in this treatise, two kinds of moral law, the law of works and the law of faith. The law of works consists of, quote, the law of nature, knowable by reason, as well as the law given by Moses, unquote, that is the Ten Commandments. And I assume this would also include the theory of natural rights, to the extent that they're grounded in reason and respecting nature. The law of faith, however, refers to our obligation to believe whatever God wants us to believe, for example, that Jesus is the Messiah. And this too is in effect, he says, a law of nature, as it is, quote, a part of the law of nature that man ought to obey every positive law of God, unquote. Locke lists from the New Testament a number of these divine commands that require our obedience. For instance, from the Gospel of Luke, quote, Whoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted, unquote. So the implication or the implied command is be humble. Or that Jesus, quote, commands self-denial and the exposing ourselves to suffering and danger rather than to deny or disown him, unquote. And there's a host of others. On Locke's view, quote, he that shall collect all the moral rules of the philosophers, and he means the pagan philosophers, and compare them with those contained in the New Testament, will find them to come short of the, moral, of the morality delivered by our Savior, unquote. For Locke, the story of the life of Jesus and his apostles, miracles and all, 
including the Old Testament prophecies foretelling his, uh, his coming, form a coherent story that it is reasonable to believe. The elements of the story, um, they cannot themselves be demonstrated by reason, though they are together, he says, quote, the footsteps which God has made visible to human reason. To his credit, Locke did not let uh, his did not let enthusiasm or faith influence his conception of the role of government, at least generally and, and as far as I can tell. So, for example, in his letter on toleration, he writes, "Quote: If a Catholic believes that to be really the body of Christ, which another man calls bread, he does no injury thereby to his neighbor. If a Jew does not believe that the New Testament," is the word of God, he does not thereby alter anything in men's civil rights. If a heathen doubts of both testaments, he is not therefore to be punished as a pernicious citizen." Unquote. We shouldn't fault Locke all that much. One man cannot do everything. Moreover, we are all still reaping the benefit of any remaining though dwindling influence of his political philosophy. And Locke was not the only decent enlightenment figure who made such a concession to religion. This is really widespread. To give just one example, the French philosopher Pierre Bell, uh, who died in 1706, in true enlightenment fashion, denounced the irrational belief that comets are evil omens. But in matters of ethics, he refers to the grace of the Holy Spirit. My point is, and this really is the point of my talk, that however excellent Locke and his like were, the concession to Christian ethics, even in such a watered down form, was disastrous. Moving on. Now, the, parad the paradigmatic Enlightenment era skeptic is David Hume, who died in 1776. Now, Hume presents some really powerful arguments against the teleological argument for the existence of God, the design argument, and against the notion of a God that is omniscient, omnipotent, and benevolent. That's the problem of evil. But such objections are undercut by his skeptical contempt for the power of reason, which is contrary to the spirit of the Enlightenment. In his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, he writes, quote, let us become thoroughly sensible of the weakness, blindness, and narrow limits of human reason. Let us duly consider its uncertainty and endless contrarieties even in subjects of common life and practice. Let the errors and deceits of our very senses be set before us." Unquote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He goes on even uh, casting doubt on the certainty of mathematics. So however good his arguments about the existence and nature of God might be in a different context, his objections to philosophically based religious beliefs amount to the inability of reason to grasp the truth about such things. For instance, against the idea that a divine intelligence, God, is responsible for the order we observe in the universe, he objects, quote, for aught we know a priori, that is, for all we know in the absence of sensory evidence. There's no video footage of the creation, the beginning of the universe, or where it gets its orderliness. Uh, for aught we know a priori, matter may contain the source or spring of order originally within itself, unquote. We don't know what caused the order we observe in the universe. Maybe it was a divine intelligence. Maybe matter just organizes itself that, that way. He's agnostic. So it is, it's no coincidence that throughout much of the dialogues concerning natural religion, the character that represents Hume, namely Philo, 
is allied with the advocate of faith as the only basis of religious belief, Demia, against the character Cleanthes, who is the Enlightenment religious figure, who is confident in reason's ability to demonstrate the existence and nature of God. Hume's philosophy is ultimately hopeless as a force against religion, because in the end, religious faith depends on the notion that reason is limited. As the eponymous character in Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray puts it, and this is meant as a criticism, quote, skepticism is the beginning of faith, unquote. Hume is not interested in defending Christian ethics and the faith that supports it, at least as far as I can tell. But another philosopher, one that Hume woke from a dogmatic slumber, is interested in Christian ethics, to say the least. I turn now to Immanuel Kant, who died in 1804, and his conception of what is sometimes called rational faith. As Ankar described yesterday, Kant claims that because the human mind and how it operates has a specific identity, we can never know reality as it is, only as it appears to us, as it's presented to us. This means that there are some crucially important truths about the very nature of reality, including human, reality, uh, human nature, that reason cannot reach. And if it tries to, it ends in contradiction. This is the problem of metaphysics. So for example, whether the universe is eternal or was created, whether humans have free will or all their actions are determined by antecedent factors, whether one soul dies with the body or survives and is immortal. Reason cannot function in trying to answer these questions. Right? This is to, to try, to try to answer these questions is to try to understand reality as it is in itself. And yet these are important issues. What Kant argues in the case of these issues is, if one of these possibilities, one of these, you know, the two pairs, if one side of the alternative views, if one of these possibilities allows us to make more sense of the world and our place in it than the alternative, if it serves what he calls the needs of practical reason, that is, in effect, of ethics, then it is rational to hold that belief. To be sure, it is a belief that in itself is unsupported by reason. But nevertheless, it's rational and reasonable to hold it. Hence, rational faith. For instance, based on the facts of reality as they, are, they appear to us, we would have to conclude that there's no guarantee that people will achieve happiness in proportion to their virtue here on earth. Quote, it can be counted upon only if a supreme reason that governs according to moral rules, only God, be posited as underlying nature as its cause, unquote. This positing is the move to rational faith. We can reasonably believe that a just God exists and souls are immortal, for otherwise the moral law would, make, would not make sense. Religion, Kant says in the critique of practical reason, quote, is the, is the recognition of all duties as divine commands, unquote. Moral philosophy, he thinks, that is reasoning functioning on its own, he thinks, can establish what our duties are religion makes them commands from God with all that that implies. Thank your pardon. Believing the universe had a creator, humans have free will and souls survive the death of the body, all allow us to make more sense of the world and our place in it. In fact, they make morality possible and intelligible. I mean, if there's no free will, Morality makes no sense. And thus we are justified in having faith in these beliefs. Beliefs that again, in themselves are not supported by reason. 
And the most famous line in the critique of pure reason, or the B edition, provides us with Kant's motivation. Quote, I have found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith, unquote. And faith here includes faith in Christian ethics as he conceives of it. For Kant, without faith, the world would not be fully intelligible and our various knowledge and beliefs would be disintegrated. They wouldn't add up to anything, coherent. Rational faith ties it all together and makes it intelligible and livable. I mention this because as we'll see in shortly, Ayn Rand holds the exact opposite view of what faith does to the rest of our knowledge. That is, if we attempt to append faith-based beliefs to those su supported by reason. I should also add that whereas someone like Locke was fully an enlightenment figure in full support of our rational pursuit of life, liberty, property, and happiness, who kept a tenuous hold on religious ethics, Kant was not. He may have regarded himself, and he is generally held to be, a pro-enlightenment figure. And it seems that he actually did condemn other, what other uh, enlightenment figures called enthusiasm. As Kant scholar Alan Wood puts it, quote, Kant was deeply skeptical of popular religious culture, severely disapproving of the traditional activities of prayer and religious ceremonies, and downright hostile of ecclesiastical authority. He had no patience at all for the mystical or the miraculous, unquote. Well, I reject the reference to the mystical here, um, but what's left is really religious ethics. But in fact, Kant was a wolf in pro, uh, sorry, in, he was a wolf in pro-enlightenment clothing. He wanted to make room for faith in order to support an ethics that flew in the face of the enlightenment, a duty ethics that did not value but opposed the moral worth of an individual's concern for life, liberty, property, and happiness. And if that required denying the efficacy of reason and its ability to know reality as it is, so be it. Fortunately for us and our lives, the American founding fathers were influenced by Locke rather than by Hume and Kant. I want to focus on Thomas Jefferson as their representative. He wasn't the only one who held such views, but he was, I think, the, the best. And his conception of the role of reason as applied to religion is really clear and even better than Locke's, I think. Um, now, how, according to Jefferson, should a person with a proper, robust, enlightenment conception of reason, how should we approach religion? This is what Jefferson says on the subject in his famous letter to his nephew, Peter Carr from 1787. Quote, in the first place, divest yourself of all bias in favor of novelty and singularity of opinion. Indulge them in any other subject rather than that of religion. It is too important and the consequences of error may be too serious. That is what he's saying, don't go to LA or India and come back a Buddhist or Scientologist. You know, that's kind of his view there. That's me, uh, not Jefferson. Back to Jefferson. On the other hand, shake off all the fears and servile prejudices under which weak minds are servilely crouched. Fix reason firmly in her seat and call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion, Question with boldness even the existence of a God, because if there be one, he must more approve the homage of reason than that of blindfolded fear. And that's how he's characterizing faith. You will naturally uh, examine first the religion of your own country. Read the Bible then as you would read Livy or Tacitus, unquote. Livy and Tacitus are Roman historians, ancient Roman historians, whose histories include stories about uh, Roman and pagan gods. For instance, in the Germania, Tacitus reports, quote, 
the Germans celebrate an earthborn god called Tuisto, whose son Manus is supposed to be the fountainhead of their race, unquote. Do you believe this? Jefferson is asking. Do you believe the stories about Adam and Eve? What this means, Jefferson goes on to say, is that in reading the stories in the Bible, for instance, uh, involving miracles, you have to ask yourself, which is more likely to be true? That the sources of the Bible are unreliable or that the laws of nature have been violated? And I think it's quite clear what he thinks about this. Jefferson here leaves open the question of God's existence, but he does not leave any room for faith. I'll add that uh, like Locke and because of Locke, Jefferson was brilliant on issues of church and state, opposing any state support for or oppression of religious belief or its absence. In his notes on the state of Virginia, he writes, quote, the legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others. But it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg, unquote. It's really excellent. But what about Christian morality? Jefferson writes, quote, I am a Christian in the only sense Jesus wished anyone to be, sincerely attached to his doctrines in preference to all others, ascribing to himself every human excellence and believing he never claimed any other." Unquote. For instance, Jefferson says that Jesus's moral doctrines, quote, were more pure and perfect than those of the most correct of the philosophers, unquote. And he specifically mentions here the Christian notion of loving all of mankind. Now, Jefferson didn't limit reason to make room for faith and Christian ethics. He was a staunch defender of individual rights and so of the egoism that that implies, like Locke. But Jefferson, too, accepted, albeit in a watered-down, even secular form, Christian ethics, which, it should be clear, was the culture's default setting, so to speak. And that's the real problem. Christian morality is morality for these figures, and they didn't quite know how to um, dislodge it or replace it. In the absence of a philosopher who could defend an alternative conception of ethics, consonant with the values of the Enlightenment, the theory of rights accepted by the Founding Fathers, and the this-worldly egoistic ethics implicit in it could not withstand the growing influence of Hume and especially of Kant, which eventually proceeded virtually unchecked, as um, uh, Ankar Gatte described last night. Ayn Rand, it's going to sound like I'm quoting Ankar, but we're both, you know, great minds think alike. Ayn Rand was the kind of philosopher the Enlightenment needed and deserved, but never had. And I regard her philosophy, objectivism, as the fulfillment of the Enlightenment project. What the Enlightenment needed and what her philosophy provides are first a proper conception of reason, its nature, power, and validation, and as a corollary of this, a deeper understanding of the precise nature of faith and the disastrous consequences of accepting any beliefs on faith, and so a more radical rejection of it. And building on this and related to it, what was needed was an entirely new ethical system. Now, yesterday, Ankar provided a sketch of Ayn Rand's primacy of existence philosophy in its five major branches. So I'll just add a sketch of her radical rejection of faith. Reason, according to Ayn Rand, is based on the evidence of the senses and functions by logic. Humans are not omniscient or infallible, but that does not mean that the mind is limited in the way skeptics and religionists and Kant claim it is. 
She rejects as incoherent the idea that certain things are inherently unknowable. And crucially important in this context of reason and faith is integration. Integrating one's knowledge into a coherent system which is rooted in reality and avoid, const and avoid const uh, contradiction, right? She writes in Art and Cognition that, quote, the enemies of reason seem to know that integration is the psychoepistemological key to reason, and that if reason is to be destroyed, it is man's integrating capacity that has to be destroyed, unquote. Although she isn't here describing faith specifically, this is the effect faith has. No harmony of reason and faith is possible. No fides et ratio uh, going hand in hand on her view. Anything accepted on faith acts to promote or involve the disintegration of one's cognition to some extent. It is a wrench thrown into the machinery of the mind. The virtue of rationality, she writes in Galt's speech, includes the recognition of the fact, quote, that reason is an absolute that permits no compromise. That a concession to the irrational invalidates one's consciousness and turns it from the task of perceiving to the task of faking reality that the alleged shortcut to knowledge, which is faith, is only a short circuit destroying the mind, that the acceptance of a mystical invention is a wish for the annihilation of existence and properly annihilates one's consciousness." Unquote. This is not true of just any error in cognition. She writes that, quote, an error made on your own is safer than 10 truths accepted on faith because the first leaves you the means to correct it, but the second destroys your capacity to distinguish truth from error, unquote. Now, why? Why does she believe that a concession to faith turns one's mind to the task of faking reality? Why can't I if reason does not seem to give me the answer to some important, difficult question, in the meantime, will to believe uh, something that satisfies a need. Because anyone who accepts the validity of faith is giving himself or his subconscious a standing order. It is okay to accept something unsupported by reason if it, if it what? Well, if it serves a need. What does that mean? The concept faith is in epistemology what God is in metaphysics. It's defined negatively by what it's not. Faith is the conscious acceptance of a belief in the absence of reason. But in fact, if a belief is not based on reason, even a mistaken belief based on, you know, the mistaken, you know, a mistaken one's reason, if it's not based on reason, it must be based on something else. And the only alternative is emotion. Faith is a special sanctified kind of belief that one holds because one wants it to be true, or one feels it serves a need, or one feels insecure about the functioning of one's own mind and has more trust in tradition or what everyone else believes passively accepting the views of others. In fact, faith in the supernatural, Ayn Rand writes, begins as faith in the superiority of others. Quote, when a mystic declares that he feels the existence of a power superior to reason, he feels it all right. But that power is not an omniscient super spirit of the universe. It is the consciousness of any passerby to whom he has surrendered his own." Unquote. Now, I think Ayn Rand's best nonfiction description of a mind that accepts things on faith is in philosophy who needs it, although what she's describing is not limited to faith-based uh, beliefs. 
after pointing out that your need for philosophy, that our need for philosophy is inescapable, she says, quote, your only choice is whether you define your philosophy by a conscious, rational, disciplined process of thought and scrupulously logical deliberation, or let your subconscious accumulate a junk heap of unwarranted conclusions, false generalizations, undefined contradictions, undigested slogans, unidentified wishes, doubts, and fears thrown together by chance, but integrated by your subconscious into a kind of mongrel philosophy." Unquote. Except that in the case of faith, the unwarranted conclusions, false generalizations, undefined contradictions, etc., are conveniently contained in a sacred text purportedly containing the word of God, and are at least in part consciously accepted. But such packaging does not make for a stable, coherent, integrated set of beliefs consistent with reason. The Enlightenment heroes did not accept mystical inventions as a wish for the annihilation of existence. But they accepted, often unknowingly or reluctantly, some version of Christian ethics in effect as an act of faith. And this ultimately had the same destructive effect it has on an individual's cognition. This is true in the case of political philosophy as you cannot integrate a pro-reason individual rights-based political philosophy and a faith-based ethics, right? An implicit egoism and a Christian altruism. And that's a point that Ayn Rand makes often. More fundamentally, she makes clear the relationship between faith, or as she puts it, mysticism um, and altruism in uh, her talk, Faith and Force, the Destroyers of the Modern World. And as a corollary of this, she talks about the incompatibility of reason and altruism. Quote, it is only mysticism that can permit moralists to get away with altruism. It was mysticism the unearthly, the supernatural, the irrational, that has always been called upon to justify it, or to be exact, to escape the necessity of justification. One does not justify the irrational. One just takes it on faith. What most moralists realize is that reason and, altruist, and altruism are incompatible. And this is the basic contradiction of Western civilization, reason, versus altruism. The real conflict, of course, is reason versus mysticism. But if it weren't for the altruist morality, mysticism would have died when it did die at the Renaissance, leaving no vampire to haunt Western culture." Unquote. So I want to repeat that. If it weren't for the altruist morality, mysticism, religion, would have died when it did die at the Renaissance. What I've presented today was meant to be in part a sketch of how this worked, how the altruist morality kept mysticism, religion alive. The enlightenment figures faith in effect that the teachings of Christianity must in some sense be at the center of ethics. That's the short circuit at present slowly destroying the rational, free and prosperous society that they envisioned or to mix her metaphors, it's the vampire that continues to haunt Western culture. But Ayn Rand, vampire slayer, has created and bequeathed to us an ethics of rational egoism, which is a wooden stake to drive through the heart of altruism, completing the Renaissance and Enlightenment project. What we need to do is you know, help drive it through. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Robert. So we're gonna be joined for the question period. We've got about, uh, let's say 15 minutes or so for questions and we're gonna be joined by Greg Salmieri. Uh, Greg is a senior philosophy scholar and director of the objectivity program at the Salem Center and the Macomb School of Business at the University of Texas, Austin. That's a very long title. Uh, Greg is also an instructor in ARI's Objectivist Academic Center and a frequent speaker at ARI events. So Greg, are you uh, able to 
turn yourself on and make an I appearance? Think I, I think I've done so. Can you guys see me? Yes. Hi, Greg. Thanks for hi, joining. Hi, Robert. Hi, talk. Greg. Okay, so let's and get cool right to the background. We're, uh, all right, so we're going to be using the Zoom Q&A module. So again, if you look at your Zoom controls, you should see a button that says Q&A, and we're taking written questions using the Q&A module only, not over the chat. We've already got a bunch of questions in here, and we've only got about 15 minutes, so let's just dive right in. Um, so the first question, did you... Did Robert, would you say the Catholic Church played any role in propagating Kant's philosophy? That's a good question, and I don't really know um, know the answer to that. Uh, uh, the uh, my inclination is to say no. They regarded they tended to regard uh, Kant as an enemy, as this alternative to. Um, I mean, Catholic philosophy at this time was Thomism, and they regarded. Uh, Kant as an enemy, you know, this kind of Lutheran uh, different sort of view. So I don't think they propagated it. Uh, I don't think they provided any kind of serious um, opposition. But as, as you know, there must be a history that some German wrote in the 19th century dissertation about on the back and forth, uh, you know, fighting between uh, Kantian uh, philosophers and Kant himself and Catholics at the time. Uh, and I don't have a clue about how that worked out, but maybe uh, Greg has something to add there. Um, <clears throat> I, well, I would just second the general point that Catholic philosophers tend to see themselves or have tended to see themselves, the, the neo-Thomists, uh, the Louvain school people and so forth, have tended to see themselves as anti-Kantian and um, to be presenting a kind of version of Aquinas and, and Aristotle as a antidote to Kant. Um, but my sense is that uh, more recently, that movement too has gotten uh, Kantianized. Um, really? Aren't those Lonergan people kind of uh, Kantian? So I think more recent Catholic philosophy has kind of imbibed Kant, but I, I don't think they were a driver of his reemergence. I also don't think they were a of his you know coming to power uh, ideologically. I also don't think they were much of an opposition, though they tried to be. Okay, we have a question from Ezekiel. Can a rationalistic approach to God be compatible with objectivism at some level? I assume what he means is, a, is, a, is, a, is an approach based on reason. So not by de de just declaring that God exists, but sort of looking for proofs of God's existence. Um, I would say that if a, a young person is uh, rational and is raised in a certain environment, it, it's, it's certainly appropriate to ask, uh, are there arguments for the existence of God? What are they? Um, do they work, etc.? I don't think you can come to the conclusion that yes, there is such a being, uh, I, I would argue. And if you did come to that conclusion, if you think there are really excellent arguments for the existence of God, I don't think that would be compatible with being an objectivist because it would re reject their entire metaphysics. And if we got to discussing the details I expect we would come to, you know, real issues with one's grasp of cognition, how it works, how one forms a concept of a being like God, et cetera. Um, yeah, I agree. If there's a God, objectivism is false. At least if there's anything like what's meant by God by the people who talk about him. Uh, but part of the problem with God is it's a vague and ill-defined concept. And uh, so, you know, one can imagine something you might call God, but it's anything like what's meant by God is incompatible with objectivism and it's incompatible with making the most of one's life. Uh, and uh, there's no reason to believe in such a thing. But if you had one, then we'd all have to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, I'll just add in Leonard Peikoff's book, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, there's a lot of discussion about metaphysics and these kinds of issues. And you can, that's a, that's a good reference if you, uh, if you wanna look at what he says there about God. And in general, um, though, one shouldn't be thinking about what's compatible or incompatible with objectivism. One should be thinking about what's true. If you figure out that there's a God somehow, or you think the best evidence leads you to there, then you should be thinking, well, what else is true? And it's not going to be objectivism as a whole, but maybe you'll find some bits that you can still agree with. Uh, on the other hand, if you find yourself starting to believe it, you know, coming at it with both a belief in, in objectivism and in God, there's a contradiction there and you're gonna to have to check your premises and see which, which parts of what you hold are true. And the premises you have to check, God is something that doesn't have an identity. 
a specific identity, doesn't have a specific nature that somehow overrides the identities of everything that exists so that nothing is what it is. And, um, and there are just a million other contradictions that come up. Okay, a couple questions from an anonymous attendee. I think they're related. So the, the, this person is asking about Thomas Reed and what sort of role he and his followers in Scotland played during the Enlightenment. And then I think a more general question is if, if early modern natural law theorists kept Aristotle's concept of substance and essences, formal and final causes, and weren't misled into nominalism, do you think the Enlightenment project would have fared better? Um, I, I have to pass on the Thomas Reed. If I, that's the kind of a whole Scottish Enlightenment, I, I really know nothing about that. Um, I don't know that those aspects that are named of the Aristotelian philosophy would have helped a great deal. I, I, that's not. I don't think what kept the Enlightenment from being perfect or you know um, living up to its potential as, as um, or of ultimately. Um, uh, failing in certain ways, uh, I, it wasn't because they didn't um, they didn't um, accept uh, Aristotle as understood by Thomas Aquinas with certain views of essence and substance and all that. Um, yeah, that that's all I could say about that. Uh, on Reed, I'm also no expert on Reed. My my impression is that he was good as a uh, pointing out some of the absurdities of Hume and that we shouldn't follow Hume in them, but and, and, that, and showing how some of these arose from ideas in Hume's predecessors, even back to Descartes, but that he didn't have much of a positive alternative to offer, that it was kind of lame, you should just go by common sense and so forth, without um, being able to solve the kind of epistemic problems that really needed solving. And that brings us to the question that was asked about Aristotle, and uh, another question um, that is on here, what is Rand's defense of reason that the Enlightenment needed but lacked? Which you can kind of lump into that question about what if the uh, early Enlightenment thinkers had stuck with certain notions of Aristotle? And I think it, it's not exactly the, the list of, um, right. of concepts that uh, the, the questioner said held in those ways, at least not the way Aristotle held them. But what I think the issue is, is there's a distinctively Aristotelian view of reason that is held by the thinkers in the early enlightenment, even when they're breaking free of Aristotle. And I would add to the ones that Ankar and Robert mentioned, the thinkers, Francis Bacon, who I think is in a way uh, the, a little earlier than the Kardec or contemporary and much better. But what these thinkers have uh, is a, an ambition for a kind of deep scientific understanding of the world which involves grasping things in essentials and seeing how you can understand their features in accordance with those essentials. And for the main line of these thinkers, which includes Bacon on the one hand and also Locke on the other, they, but not Descartes, they think that this kind of reasoning can be built up from sense perception. On the basis of sense perception, you can grasp the essentials of things and you can um, understand the world in those terms. And I think that's what's really needed um, the, and that is all in Aristotle. But the, the problem is Aristotle didn't have enough to say on how you can do it, what the method of doing it is. He says it starts from the senses somehow, but either he doesn't explain how or it's not as clear as one would like, depending on, um, anyway, it's not as clear as these thinkers would like. And B uh, Bacon in particular really excoriates Aristotle for that. He thinks we need a new, uh, a new method. And I think he went some way towards providing a new method. Locke thinks this too. And both Bacon and Locke really focus on grounding it, grounding this new method in sense perception and showing the steps by which you can go from sense perception to, uh, to, uh, to science. But from Locke on, it's dominated by a Cartesian view of sense perception, which cuts it off from reality in ways that Ankar discussed uh, yesterday. And I think it's, it's that that leads them further and further away from the idea that you could ever get at the essences of things. And already in Locke, that's really deeply undercut. And then Hume and Kant uh, sever it much more. And I think that's really the problem. So there is something related to this idea of essence, but it's not just maintaining Aristotle. There was a kind of check that had to be cashed and 
this line of thinkers didn't cash it. And for uh, in what way does Ayn Rand do that and, and how? Um, chapter The chapter on epistemology that I wrote in the book, A Companion to Ayn Rand, I think it's chapter 12, um, is set up along just these lines of uh, what is the challenge in the Enlightenment epistemically and uh, what's Rand's answer to it. So uh, it's a kind of long issue. You have to go through the theory of concepts to discuss, but I recommend that chapter self-surfing though that recommendation is for people who uh who want Hold the book closer to the camera greg so people can see it a companion uh, to ayn rand uh edited by alan gotthelf and myself all right uh, i want to bring in some questions uh that were asked in spanish and translated for us um so one of them is do you think the widespread religious attitude in latin america is is is, has an influence on the region's embrace of collectivist policies. And it says the region's rejection of objectivism. Um, but I think the, it, the uh, embrace of collectivist policies is that, uh, can you attribute that to the widespread religious attitude in Latin America? I would think it would have to have something to do with that. That the, the um, I think uh, Christianity and, and Catholicism especially um, has a lot in common with the most collectivist ideas of the, the 20th century and they easily embraced some of them. Um, I teach at a Catholic university and there's, uh, there, you know, I know Catholic intellectuals who, um, you know, you, with the exception of the atheism stuff, they, they, they're Marxists. And you have, I mean, even the, the, um, what is it? Uh, the something theology, the um, liberation, theology. liberation theology. Uh, that's very much um, part of what's going on. So I would say that that's my, um, I mean, there are some Catholics who say yes, you know, but, but there's some encyclical from the 19th century that supports property rights. And so we're not, we're not Marxist and all that, but that's not enough to sustain uh, um, a real resistance against um, collectivist ideas. And, and one of the points that Ayn Rand makes is that you cannot, you cannot have a nice mix between altruism and uh, a political philosophy based on individual rights. And when the altruism is really pronounced, I think uh, collectivism is just a natural uh, consequence of that. One thought on this, not specific to Latin America, but Ayn Rand commented about Russia, where she was from, that it was an especially mystical religious country. And she thought that that is what made it ripe for um, embracing communism and for the USSR happening there uh, rather than in a more um, secular uh, culture. And uh, you might think that the South American uh, cultures that became very collectivist have that in common with it. As for whether that's made South America reject uh, objectivism, uh, I don't know that it has. I mean, it's yeah. not like there was a time when Ayn Rand's writing was uh, well known there and then um, then receded. Uh, it, it's getting more well known there now, I understand. And so we'll see whether you guys are able to uh, convince your compatriots to accept it and how much of a bar the religiosity is to that. Uh, it will be some bar, but um, there are some bars everywhere and hopefully it'll be overcomable. Well, and, and the, the, with our excellent language interpreters, uh, we're making it more and more possible all the time for people to uh, embrace objectivism. Um, okay, let me, we're, we're, we're starting to get short on time here and we have lots of questions. I just, I just wanna remind people that we will be doing our virtual salons later today. If you don't get a chance to get your question answered here, you can join the virtual salons and ask the speakers directly. We also have an all-purpose Q&A at the end of the day, a question, one hour question period with all the speakers. So that'll be another opportunity to ask. And I wanted to bring in, we have two questions about Jefferson here and, and this may be the last one ones we get to. Um, is there a connection between Jefferson's Christian morality and his support for public education. So the comment is he's great on separation of state and religion, but not on the separation of state and education. And then a, and a similar question about Jefferson, what is the sense in which egoism is implicit in his politics? Um, you know, so could you comment on the sort of implicit egoism in the founding period? 
Well, the first one, I don't know that I see a connection. Now, maybe if, if someone knows the writings really well of Jefferson, you could see uh, that he brings in Christian ethics when he talks about education. I don't, um, just trying to deduce an answer uh, here, I wouldn't see that it would be necessary. It probably some other premise at work that if you can't have uh, you know, a rational, intelligent, um, civic body, uh, what you, you need an educated uh, citizenry uh, to make a free society that respects individual rights to work. And that's why we need public education. I would think it, I think that's an error obviously, but um, I would think that's how it went rather than that it was this, um, uh, this Christian ethics that he accepted in some form. Um, did you want to comment on that, Greg, before we get to no, this? I share your, your view of Jefferson's reasons for favoring public education, and I don't see a, a particular connection to, uh, to religiosity there or to altruism there. And, then, and then, yeah, the comment about the ego is the implicit egoism in the founding fathers. The, I mean, this goes to Locke, too. It's, they're talking about, and, and Ankara talked about this last night, we're, you're recognizing that there are individuals, that an individual should, it has a life and has a certain control of one's life and one's mind, and that they ought to use that to become industrious and uh, productive and acquire property and pursue happiness. And all of that is, you're talking about the individual. So that is an implicit um, egoism, particularly when you contrast that with what's come before. And, and so that's what we mean by an implicit uh, egoism. What, what they lacked was a philosophical defense uh, of making it a rational, explicit uh, philosophy that you have a right to, that would have shattered any interest in uh, the precepts of Jesus as a moral guide or something like that. So that would be what I would have to say. Yeah, I mean, if you think about reason as setting your course in life, reason being the guy that firmly guides you in everything you do once you fixed it in its seat, right? Or her, I guess, reasons are her, in her seat and call her tribunal on everything, including how you lead your life. And then you recognize that reason's an, at, an attribute of the individual. It's gonna be your reason that you're going to use to come up with purposes to pursue in your life. Well, then it's you leading your life by your own judgment for the goals that you've set for yourself. And that's an individualistic, egoistic kind of life. It's your judgment, your commitment to certain values as the good. They're then good for you in part because of your choice of them. And there's an implicit egoism in that. Enough egoism to uh, denote the pursuit of happiness, of your own happiness as a fundamental right, but not enough not clearly and explicitly enough egoism to break with all remnants of the past, with all remnants of Jesus, and um, to fully complete the uh, revolution. Okay, well, I think we are a little bit over time now. So uh, Greg and Robert, th Robert, thank you for, for a wonderful talk. And Greg, thanks for joining for the Q&A. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.